Song of Horror is a game that no one is really talking about, and that makes me supremely upset. Not just because it's one of the scariest games I've played in the last five years, not just because it's a masterclass in environmental storytelling and world building, and not just because it draws inspiration from some of the best early PS2 horror games while also injecting some fresh new ideas. No, the fact that nobody's talking about this game makes me upset because that means that I have to be the one to do it. I'm the one who has to subject myself to every facet of this nightmare just so everyone else can experience it from the safety of their computer screens. So this one's for you guys. <coughs> and also for the grade. <coughs> Put succinctly, Song of Horror is a third-person survival horror game that may as well have been ripped straight out of the early 2000s. It features all the tropes and hallmarks of horror games from that era. Fixed camera angles, third-person tank controls, weirdly obtuse puzzles, surreal item collecting and backtracking, it's all here. But the game isn't content to just rest on the laurels of its inspirations. It goes above and beyond to incorporate its own current-gen ideas and tech into the mix, not the least of which is the AI-driven Lovecraftian horror antagonist known as The Presence. Throughout the player's journey, they will be constantly pursued by an ethereal, otherworldly being that manifests itself to the player in a variety of unscripted manners. This can be as innocuous as appearing as an ominous aura around the player, or giving them a little spook with a sudden smattering of hands on a wall, or it can be immediately life-threatening, requiring the player to act quickly or succumb to falling victim to the shadows. <laughs> this blending of classic third-person horror tropes and current-gen tech and new ideas creates a surprisingly cohesive and engaging experience that makes Song of Horror unendingly stressful and deliciously horrifying for almost every single second. So, without further ado, let's put my suffering to good use and get to analyze it. At its core, Song of Horror is very Lovecraftian in nature. It pits a cast of characters against an otherworldly being that is beyond comprehension, inescapable, and seemingly omniscient. Simply known as The Presence, this corrupt entity pursues the player throughout their journey and is controlled by an AI director that is constantly looking for the optimal time to begin its haunting. The Presence is able to interact and mess with the player in a variety of ways, as it has no actual physical body and can show up at any time almost anywhere. This can range from a few benign things, such as sending a chill throughout the area, triggering a harmless but distressing earthquake, or making a few mysterious wisps float around the player character. These are often used to make the player panic, causing them to make rash decisions that have a high probability of leading them to an untimely demise. The presence is also able to trigger some level-specific vignettes, or sound triggers, to both chill the player to their core as well as provide some rather elegant world-building and environmental storytelling. Since the player is often exploring areas that have already been tainted by the curse of the presence, they might be subjected to events that range from mildly startling to downright bone chilling. Oh. And because these events are both numerous and have a random chance of occurring, it's incredibly likely that a player will not encounter many of the scary details and will still be surprised on multiple playthroughs. Many would argue that repetition and predictability in horror games very quickly diminishes their effectiveness when it comes to instilling fear in a player. It's tempting to say that an unpredictable AI-controlled enemy would be the perfect solution to this problem. However, I think it's worth appreciating the enormous risk that the devs took to make it a focal point of their game. If the AI ever seemed unfair, killing the player for reasons beyond their control, or too predictable and repetitive, the entire atmosphere of the game would be compromised. One of the main appeals of horror games comes from what's known as horror self-efficacy. Essentially, it's the belief in one's ability to endure and face the challenges that a horror game presents. Successfully enduring the events of a horror game provides a sort of cognitive euphoria that keeps us coming back for more. This kind of self-efficacy can't be achieved if the AI is far too punishing or far too predictable. For the most part, I would say that the developers of Song of Horror did an excellent job of walking this tightrope. All the different ways that the presence can manifest itself serve very distinct purposes as they try to elicit emotion from the player. Obviously, measuring how much a subjective experience like playing a game influences a person's emotions is tricky to say the least, so I want to establish a sort of model for evaluating that before I delve into specifics. There are many schools of thought when it comes to mapping a person's emotions when they are affected by some sort of external event. One popular method involves plotting a person's current state of emotion on a three-dimensional axis, measuring pleasure, awakeness, and tension. This three-way interaction of emotion has been modified when observing specifically horror games to instead plot a player's fear level, horror self-efficacy, and arousal. 
All three of these factors play a large role in interacting with each other to affect a player's enjoyment. For instance, a player who is experiencing a high fear level but feels no horror self-efficacy due to either the game being too hard or their skill level being too low will not experience the enjoyment of the resulting cognitive euphoria. Conversely, if a player is highly skilled or the game is too easy, their horror self-efficacy will be high but their fear level will be low, resulting in a similar unsatisfying situation. Arousal adds itself into the mix in its own complicated way, as it essentially measures how engaged with the experience the player is. High arousal players experience a narrowed attention causing them to focus on details and respond more strongly to threats when they're presented, whereas low arousal players might find themselves missing some details here and there causing them not to react as strongly. This doesn't necessarily correlate with fear, as a player can experience high arousal and engagement tearing through a horde of zombies without feeling scared at all. However, when balanced along the other two axes, taking advantage of a player currently experiencing high arousal can be an excellent way to get the player to experience that euphoria by the time they reach the end of your virtual nightmare. Wake up. So, fear, horror self-efficacy, and arousal. We'll assume that those who choose to play horror games will generally experience a relatively high fear level. What some people might find scary might seem totally lame to others, but it's been noted that those who actively seek out horror games tend to have a much higher chance of deriving enjoyment from them. So let's see how the present stacks up when it comes to balancing the other two axes, starting with the harmless tricks that it pulls on the player. Ah! The panic-inducing segments of Faux Danger are actually pretty effective tools at turning up arousal while simultaneously giving the player a sense of higher self-efficacy. It's not immediately clear to the player what they must do to overcome what's currently happening to them, but they're in control of the character the entire time, and many players have different strategies to cope with the hauntings. Some try to turn off their lights and hide in the darkness, Others try to leave the room and escape the influence of their cursed immediate vicinity. However, no matter what they do, they will almost always be successful. The threat will subside after a certain amount of time, and the player will feel like they've survived some ordeal by the skin of their teeth. The procedural sound generation is also a particularly inspired decision, as audio has been known to be an incredible influence on a player's current level of tension and arousal. <laughs> Now that the player is in this higher state of arousal, their eyes are likely darting around the screen, especially every time the camera angle changes. A cornerstone of horror games is the constant struggle of threat detection and threat negotiation. How fast can a player perceive a potential threat, and if a threat does present itself, will they be able to handle it? Particularly in Song of Horror and many other survival horror games of its kind, threat detection takes center stage, since the lack of combat makes negotiating threats almost a non-option. Because the player is primed with this mode of threat detection, and the game has been constantly attempting to increase their arousal, it's the perfect time to startle them with a quick jump scare, or chill them to the bone with a quiet, horrifying detail for their eyes to lock onto. This is where the horror vignettes work to great effect. Even for players who have already completed the game, the nature of the AI-driven director ensures that they are likely to experience the game differently on repeated playthroughs. Finally, I'd like to discuss the ways in which the presence can actually hunt down and kill the player. There are quite a few options in this being's arsenal, so I'd like to explain them all quickly, then assess how effective they are as horror experiences. Firstly, the presence can hide behind doors, ready to snatch a player away into the abyss if they fail to listen for it before entering a room. In a nice display of accessibility, the devs were forward-thinking enough to anticipate that this mechanic would be absolutely terrible for deaf people, so they included an option to show a visual indicator for it as well. As a side note, I think it's super great to see indie devs do this kind of stuff, as they're some of the best positioned people to implement it when considering the cost of investment versus the potential audience secured. Moving on, the presence eventually graduates from hiding behind doors and instead attempts to burst right through them. During these moments, the player must make their way to the cursed door and play a quick time event minigame in order to close it before it's too late. Taking advantage of its ethereal existence, the presence can also corrupt the surrounding area of the player, forcing them to search for a hiding spot as quickly as possible, then play a rhythm-based minigame to avoid being discovered. The presence can also take the form of several different corrupt entities to stalk the player. The Silence, for instance, is a blind creature that hunts based on sound. When the player encounters them, they are immediately thrust into a minigame where they can't move and must manage their breathing in order to avoid detection. The Abyss is another manifestation that throws subtlety to the wind and just straight up tries to drag the player down into the unknown depths below. The player has to match several different buttons repeatedly in order to escape. Finally, the Requiem is the last form that the presence may take to hunt the player. It can only be seen in a hand mirror that the character automatically raises during an encounter, and the player must direct light at it in order to vanquish it. Of all these encounters, I would argue that the door closing and hiding segments provide the most enjoyment to the player. Not only are they the encounters that the player has the most control in influencing, resulting in a higher horror self-efficacy, but they also are among some of the most complex, 
The rules that are presented to the player allow them to make some interesting choices in terms of how to handle the incoming threat. Do I try to make my way back to a hiding spot that was super far away? Or do I try my luck and look for a different one nearby? Do I try to slam the door as soon as I can? Or should I build up some strength first? These sorts of choices make these encounters much more interesting, and they're a direct result of the sudden change and introduction of rules that happens every time these encounters occur. In contrast, the Silence, Requiem, and Abyss encounters have far fewer rules that result in interesting player choices. In each of them, the player character is locked to a specific position until the minigame is completed. There's only one way to resolve the encounter, so most of the engagement comes from how difficult that encounter is to overcome. Unfortunately, this inherently means that the more a player experiences these events, the better that they will get at handling them, which runs the risk of lowering a player's overall arousal and hurting their enjoyment. As a whole, however, I would say that the AI horrors of the presence do an excellent job of providing a solid horror experience. Its shortcomings may be noticeable on multiple playthroughs, but the procedural nature of it makes it far more difficult to become too comfortable with them. And speaking of constant discomfort, it's time to move on to the next interesting design choice that Song of Horror centers its game design around. In most games, even outside of the survival horror genre, the punishment for dying in the game has been generally minimal. Worst case scenario, the player might get sent back to the last known save point and lose a bit of progress. While this could be an inherent motivator for some, in my opinion, such a system doesn't fully live up to its potential of capturing the dread intention of constantly trying to avoid an early demise. Song of Horror takes a step in the right direction in this regard by making its punishment for death not only brutal, but also a cornerstone of its design. When a character gets snatched up by the presence, they're gone for the rest of the game. The player is forced back to the character select screen and must choose a new victim to continue the journey. If they run out of characters to select from, or if the main protagonist meets his demise, the chapter must be restarted from the beginning. And that's just the high level of what's going on here. In practice, there are actually quite a few other subtle nuances that really breathe life into this mechanic and serve to further accentuate the fear. For one thing, it would be easy for a player interacting with such a system to treat the limited pool of characters like a lives system. If you have four characters to play as in a chapter, you can afford to mess up three times before getting sent back to the beginning. However, in actuality, the designers went to great lengths to attempt to get the players to connect with these characters by giving each one subtle nuances that make them feel distinct. Given the different backgrounds that they come from, each character has their own flavor of explanatory text when they observe different things in their environment. These little blurbs are often coded in bias, and they really give you a sense of who the character is as a person. Each character also has their own unique stats, making them either better or worse equipped to handle certain situations as they arise. On top of that, they each have their own unique personal item that grants that character a unique passive hidden buff. Omar's glasses, for instance, allow him to instantly discover points of interest on an item without having to pinpoint exactly where it is. All of these subtle differences help to encourage the player to view these characters as individuals and not just dispensable lives. This provides a solid foundation for players to start connecting with them. The more time they spend with a character, the more they'll get to know their personality and understand them. This opens the way to a fantastic opportunity for the player to start developing and firing mirror neurons, which really put them into the shoes of their digital avatar. In a nutshell, the concept of mirror neurons is an observed result of empathy or connection with someone or something that is experiencing something secondhand. Let's say you're watching someone get pricked by a needle. The neurons that fire in your brain from watching and processing this event are actually shockingly similar to the neurons that fire in the person who is actually getting pricked. This can also trigger a phenomenon known as kinesthetic empathy interaction, wherein an observer can feel as though they are taking part in the exact same actions that they are observing. For example, spectators watching a dancer perform can feel like they're dancing as well, according to the neurons that can be observed firing. The more connected you feel to a person or events that you're observing, the stronger these sensations will feel. Understanding this, it's no surprise that so much effort was put into making these characters feel distinct and relatable. Giving these characters tangible personalities that the player can connect with serve to strengthen these mirror neurons within them and raise their tension and fear even more, knowing that, at any moment, they might forever succumb to the darkness. And I do mean at any moment. Aside from the usual presence shenanigans, the developers have also included a number of devious traps in every chapter that run the risk of punishing the player with death if they're not carefully avoided. This often flies in the face of conventional video game logic, where oftentimes the player is encouraged to explore everything in order to learn as much as possible about the world and progress. In Song of Horror, the player is burdened with the task of constantly analyzing risk and making decisions about what to do next given the information they have. Do you really need to stick your hands in that pitch black water basin? 
What are you hoping to find down there? <gasps> there might also be potential threats that lie just out of view, as the game takes a page out of classic PS2 era horror games by taking control of the camera away from the player. Instead, the player must navigate rooms and corridors under multiple fixed camera angle perspectives, which is often used to great effect to obscure dangers just outside of frame, until the player is already far too close for comfort to it. Ah! This phenomenon of hiding dangers and horrors just outside of frame, causing the player to fill with dread and anticipation of what they can't see, is known as horror vacui. It's the feeling that something ominous is nearby that is currently invisible, and you must take it upon yourself to attempt to observe it even if you really, really don't want to. Song of Horror simultaneously takes advantage of and subverts this concept with its cunning traps. Sometimes, you have to do something you really don't want to do because you have to do it. Other times, there are some things that you really don't want to do that you probably ought not to do at all. The feeling of horror vacui are the same, but it's up to the player to use the information that they collect and pay attention to the world around them in order to decide which risks are worth taking and which are likely a death sentence. This creates an environment for the player where the entire world around them is one giant, devious, fictional puzzle. Unlike a normal puzzle, which usually fall in the realm of jigsaws and simple riddles, fictional puzzles serve to provide additional context about the world and narrative. As the player navigates the space of any given chapter, they slowly piece together information about what might have happened there. This information can give them the tools that they need to unravel what they need to do next, and consequently, what they should avoid doing. Fictional puzzles in Song of Horror blend storytelling and gameplay wonderfully, as the driving narrative of the characters is to solve the mystery of the presence that haunts them, and in doing so they navigate the challenges and puzzles that make up the core gameplay, which accentuates the dread and provides context to the whole concept of the character permadeath system. All of this being said, I would be remiss if I didn't point out one area where Song of Horror stumbles in this regard. While the idea of choosing a new character to pick up where your recently deceased one left off sounds reasonable from a gameplay perspective, from a narrative standpoint it falls a little flat. The whole situation is poised for the player to experience ludonarrative dissonance, which is the disconnect that a player feels between what they're able to do in a game versus what the narrative suggests is actually happening. In the context of Song of Horror, whenever the player is forced to choose a new character to continue the journey, there is immediately a disconnect between the information that the character knows and the information that the player knows. Unlike dramatic irony where this could be used to elevate tension in the player, this information dichotomy often results in confusion and broken immersion. From there, the player might start asking questions that don't really have any answers. How does this person know what this character was in the middle of doing before they died? I've been working towards this solution all chapter and now suddenly they know what to do? This person's never encountered Requiem before. How do they know to hold up a mirror to see it? Come to think of it, how did this person even get a hand mirror in the first place? My other character didn't have one. Granted, this is a problem that doesn't really have a clear-cut solution. Ultimately, it's on the player to decide where the dividing line between narrative and gameplay is, and it's entirely possible that these sorts of situations won't bother most players. It was personally problematic for me, but I also feel as though the devs did the best that they could with making the transition between characters feel as narratively natural as they possibly could have. I'm already here and there's still so much I want to talk about. I didn't get a chance to talk about some of the especially crafty puzzles in this game, the exceptional world building, the chilling audio. Heck, I barely even touched on the plot at all and the ending. The ending! The ending is beyond the scope of this video, so I guess that'll have to wait. It is seriously commendable what the Studio Protocol Games was able to accomplish with this game. Horror can often be seen as a sort of flash in the pan experience where once the game's done, it very quickly leaves the player's head but really good horror sticks with you, and Song of Horror was meticulously crafted to poke and prod at the parts of the brain that it knows will make for an experience that you will never forget. Much like being hunted by the presence itself, you will become weighed down by the burden of knowledge, haunted by an experience that you won't be able to escape. And that, to me, is what the best horror games are all about. <laughs>